Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I am very, very excited to welcome all of you to our very first virtual launch of the semester. And again, just to remind everybody, the virtual launch um, is here as a platform for all of us to come together informally and have a chat, informal discussion about any issues um, that are relevant to us, important to us, so that you know we can just um, exchange some ideas. So because of that, if you feel you have any topic that you want to suggest, or if you want to be one of the panelists, by all means, please just get in touch with us. Um, you can get in touch with me, Walid or Noor. We're going to be more than happy um, to follow up with you. Okay. Um, this webinar is actually part of the two series um, that we are going to focus on our personal well-being because for most of you, for most of us, actually, if you thought um, in the summer of 2020, this is going to be the third semester that is fully online. And for majority of us, this is the second semester that is fully online. And most of us are so exhausted. And also, I guess, um, because there's so many different kind of stress related pandemic issues. So I thought, um, what is a better topic to start our discussion by just talking about our own personal well-being? Um, so with me today, I have three very esteemed colleagues um, that are kind enough to join us to discuss about some of the importance of taking a very good care of ourselves, personal balance, positive engagement, um, and also what exactly does it mean to be in a community like AUS. So please join me to welcome um, Ms. Jessica March. She is the Director of Academic Achievement Bridge Program. And we have Dr. Fadi Fakalu, Head of Computer Science and Engineering Department. And we have Dr. Mark Avian, the Associate Professor of Psychology. So we have three people from different backgrounds that's gonna come in um, to talk about different issues that we can definitely learn. Okay, so we're gonna start the discussion with Mark, given Mark's um, background in psychology. So, um, I think, why don't we start by having a discussion, maybe a little bit in terms of what exactly does it mean by burnout? What are the sources of burnout? And what exactly should we look for um, for that purpose? Um, so Mark? Um, are you speaking, Mark? We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the danger of like uh, keeping your mic on mute, right? Uh, thanks a lot, Narita. Really appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm looking forward to your, your feedback on, on this panel. Um, the purpose here uh, for my talk is just to give an overview of burnout uh, before the other panelists kind of dive into more specific topics um, on burnout. So I'm going to be using some slides here. Uh, you guys can see the slides, I assume. Um, and really, uh, what I wanted to do was uh, go to the literature on burnout and see what other academics were saying about this and then kind of present a summary of some of that, in addition to some of my own points. And I was really surprised how much has been actually written on this topic, uh, specifically about uh, faculty burnout. It's become um, a kind of, there's been a resurgence of interest as well with the shift to online learning around the world as well and the kind of additional burdens on our time that 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 is placed. Um, and so um, I've really learned a lot in kind of exploring this. Uh, please feel, feel free to use the uh, chat box um, while I'm presenting, uh, but, but save verbal comments maybe until Narita opens the floor because um, I have, uh, I think, five slides here with information and I might address one of your points uh, along the way and then we'll open it up uh, at some point. So um, in Looking at uh, faculty burnout, there are, I think, internal and external factors. We can kind of break this down into, I'll talk about the internal factors first. And I've divided these into professional and personal factors uh, uh, that, that can contribute to or lead to burnout. So let's get started with professional. Um, one, some of these won't surprise you, and, one of the, and they may be actually really familiar, right? Uh, one is overcommitment, which I'm calling the bad habit of saying yes. Uh, this is something that many of us do. Uh, I think, uh, and um, is one of these factors that we can control with respect to burnout, and yet um, it can be difficult to to do so. Uh, I have had this happen to me 
multiple times where I've been offered um, opportunities to collaborate with other researchers. These are interesting projects that they're proposing. I get excited about it and I don't really think about how they're going to fit into my future timeline, my future schedule, my future obligations. I don't really carefully consider that. And so uh, this is one uh, mistake I see us making sometimes is uh, really um, committing to too much and not um, kind of foreseeing what our workload is going to be in the short term or long term. Related to that is uh, sometimes inattention to core priorities and essential work, uh, meaning that we don't take time to think about what is really valuable uh, to us and what is really our highest priorities. And we, as a result, um, say yes to things that um, are lower priority, but then end up eating into the higher priority stuff. So over commitment, this first point um, is often about the number of hours that we're working, but the second point really addresses more what are we working on? And even if you're not working too many, like uh, 50, 60, 70 hour work week, it can feel like you're burned out because you may be focused on um, spending too much time on things that are not absolutely essential and that don't fit on with the things that you really, really care about. And so taking time to uh, think about these priorities and uh, essential uh, things that, that are really most valuable to us can be um, really helpful. Sometimes we have blind spots in our self-awareness and self-knowledge in terms of um, what we are actually good at and where our, our sort of current skills really are. And so we end up saying yes to things or committing to things that um, end up requiring a lot more time than we had originally anticipated or that don't take advantage of our special skills and abilities. So that's another thing uh, that, that sometimes happens. Something that um, often contributes to burnout is that we're doing things that involve status seeking and they're driven by social comparison. Instead of thinking about what's actually valuable to us as individuals, we use other people's judgments about what counts as success and um, what, what it counts as valuable um, outputs as uh, the guiding light of what we're uh, doing in our day-to-day our -day work. And as a result, we end up kind of doing the things that we want to do, but maybe also a lot of other things that were just driven by this uh, status seeking and social comparison that we're doing. And then we end up overloaded. Um, another factor on the professional side is neglecting breaks and days off. Uh, there's a lot of research I discovered on this with respect to burnout, how um, the importance of taking breaks uh, during the day, but also uh, having days off having a day off during the week, um, taking even periods of time off, uh, usually a week or two can make a huge difference and kind of feeds back into some of these previous uh, points, helping us to identify what's really important to us, where our values and priorities are. On the personal side, um, we often have underlying, uh, or sometimes we might have underlying uh, mental health problems that go beyond um, the, these professional um, issues. And so it's worth thinking about whether um, your uh, burnout or that sense of burnout is related to, um, or is mostly based on these professional um, 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 items or whether um, it may be related more to uh, something else that's happening with your um, mental life. Likewise, you could have underlying physical health problems. Maybe you're um, having some serious problems with sleep or some other underlying medical issue. And um, so this is worth thinking about or exploring. And then on the personal side, what we often see in the literature is uh, faculty uh, talking about the work-life balance uh, topic and uh, particularly with respect to marriage and family commitments or problems that they're having. Um, it may be that there aren't any problems, but it's still uh, to, to be satisfied in life, you want to uh, devote significant time to these commitments and then you uh, end up feeling burned out because you're doing that. And, um, your professional work as well, or there may be substantial problems there um, that um, need to be addressed also. So those are the those are at least a, a list of internal internal factors. It's kind of a combination of things I saw in the literature plus a couple other factors that that I've added myself. As far as external factors go, um, one of the uh, common factors that faculty mentioned in this literature is unplanned significant life events. So, you know, a parent has a medical issue. Um, there's a natural disaster, there's political conflict, uh, these types of things. And um, obviously that's not something you can plan for and it can be uh, a factor in burnout as well. 
geographical separation from family and friends is mentioned in some cases, and this is uh, something I think that a lot of us feel uh, at times teaching here in the UAE. Uh, some of us are lucky enough to have a lot of family here, but um, for others, it, it can be an issue as well. Institutional demands, um, the many different aspects of, um, of uh, our jobs that can add up to um, a, a very large workload can also be a factor. This is an external factor. It's something that's you know very often mostly out of our control. Academic culture, just going beyond the institution, the um, from the research side in particular, the publisher parish culture can be absolutely brutal. It's a highly competitive industry. You guys know this. And um, it's absolutely merciless um, when it comes to uh, a topic like burnout. Uh, Lisa Dramska and uh, some other authors have published an article recently in Current Directions in Psychological Science. And one thing that Dramska noted is that the tender clock does not care about the struggles you might be experiencing either within or outside work. And this can purpose, and even if it's not tenure, you know, if you're just trying um, in kind of a positive side of getting um, trying to accomplish your professional goals in terms of research, um, the similar pressures can be there as well. Institutional and government bureaucracy can be major factors in uh, taking up our time in ways that we often uh, feel are demotivating and unnecessary. And then uh, societal complexity as well is an issue that I wanted to add here, which I didn't see mentioned in uh, the literature, but I feel like it's a really major factor externally. Um, this involves things like dealing with your visas and passports and IDs that you have to go uh, take care of, your personal finance stuff. Um, if you own real estate, you own a vehicle, you're paying bills, health and life insurance. Um, our, our lives are, in, in this respect, much more complex than um, the lives of, of um, you know, that people have lived through most of human history. And so we have not e evolved biologically, so to speak, to um, to be adapted to this level of complexity, and it can be a really major factor, I think, in contributing to burnout. So what can we do? Um, as faculty, I think there are several things we can do. One is to kind of let go of the guilt about feeling burned out. I've noticed this in um, occasionally in colleagues, but also in the literature as well, that faculty feel like there's something wrong with them sometimes because they're feeling burnt out. And although there are those factors that are under our control, there are also a lot of things that are under, under our control. So we want to um, accept a re responsibility uh, where we can, but also have a bit of self-compassion as well. Um, taking action on, on the internal factors is, is important um, as well. And you can look down that list and see the, th you know, try to identify the things that you can uh, take action on. Um, what's often recommended in the psychology literature in this regard is uh, focusing on one thing at a time. Don't try to do everything at once. And then celebrate small victories that you have. It might be very incremental progress, but it'll add up over time. Um, consider therapy, counseling, or coaching. Um, you know, it, you don't have to have a sort of diagnosable mental illness to benefit from therapy and counseling and coaching. Um, and in fact, just having a check-in session with a therapist can be hugely beneficial um, uh, as to sort of keeping yourself oriented and grounded and kind of catching problems before they uh, come up. Um, explore your options uh, from a professional standpoint. Um, if you're feeling burnout in your current role, what are some other roles that you could step into either within the organization or externally? I find that faculty often um, underestimate the value of their skills um, in other positions in uh, their institutions, but also externally uh, going beyond academia. And it could be that there are some, um, there are some other opportunities for you out there where you may be working the same number of hours, but you're going to feel maybe more fulfilled in that work and you won't feel as burned out, or you will be able to work less and, and enjoy other aspects of your life if that's, if that's your goal. Um, the other thing is kind of just on a personal responsibility standpoint is don't contribute to other people's burnout. So uh, you may have grad students or other people who are uh, that you are mentoring or you're in charge of them um, in an organization. and um, so we want to make sure that we are not sort of proactively uh, causing or, or contributing to, to other burnout as well, including our colleagues. Um, and um, what um, what you see in the, uh, this literature as well is that when faculty have the support of their colleagues, um, when students have the support of other students or um, other people in the organization, uh, this can go a long way towards helping people when they start to experience burnout. 
So what can we do as institutions? One is to measure faculty job satisfaction skillfully so that you know when um, your faculty are in fact experiencing burnout. And there's kind of bad ways of doing these types of measurements. So you wanna make sure that you've got somebody who's skilled with that um, and in tracking that. Um, you wanna make sure that the institution's mission and goals are aligned with faculty incentives. One of the things that comes up here is uh, faculty who feel like what they're actually incentivized to do in their jobs, what they get rewarded for, doesn't align with the mission of the uh, institution um, and doesn't align with many of the particular um, tasks that they have to execute, which they're supposed to execute at sort of a high level and with a lot of um, uh, competency and skill and yet uh, which they feel are not really rewarded. And so at an institutional level, this can lead to burnout because the faculty are doing that work, but then also the work that they feel like they're actually incentivized to do. Um, misaligned incentives across institutional layers was also a theme where um, you can find that the faculty have different incentives than administrators. Administrators, for example, might be incentivized to get the institution certified or um, along with a particular external program. And in, that may require certain types of activities uh, from, from faculty or certain types of requirements on faculty. And um, the faculty and other stakeholders may not be consulted in that process. And then um, it puts more work um, on, on the faculty um, without that consultation. The incentive from the administrative side is to show that you're sort of increasing the external visibility of the university and coming into uh, common standards or best practices or something like that. Uh, but that may not map, map onto um, the uh, particular, in the incentives that uh, faculty have in their positions. So it's important to think about that. Reduce bu bureaucracy and accept accountability. One of the themes was kind of pointless bureaucracy. Um, this will not surprise you. Um, uh, sometimes we perceive a bureaucracy as pointless and, and maybe it isn't, but sometimes it, it probably is. Um, so, you know, do you really need me to give you my phone number when you are not going to call me actually <laughs> on that form? Um, or whatever it is that you're asking for, just make sure that um, that you really need that information um, and um, consider whether you actually need four or five or six different uh, people to add signatures to a particular process because this can also add to the workload that faculty have uh, for important, really important decisions that may be really necessary, but for sort of more, less important decisions, it's better sometimes just to have a, a more, um, uh, a less time consuming process. Avoid always on demands. This goes beyond universities, but this idea that we have to constantly ch be checking email, understand that there's, you know, faculty who are working on teaching and research need to be, um, uh, aren't always going to be on their email and this is an important component as well. And then avoid unnecessarily urgent tasks, you know, last minute things that could have been planned ahead, which kind of disrupt um, schedules when it comes to uh, research projects and, and teaching courses and that sort of thing but also including uh, an equitable workload criteria in faculty hiring, meaning that when you're hiring for faculty, pay attention to, the, to this issue of burnout in terms of what might be inequities right now in the distribution of workload among faculty, particularly when it comes to teaching and service and seeing whether how you can use that hiring process to address that um, and at least pay attention to it, but also maybe to create more flexible types of academic positions um, we kind of seem to be, one of the things that themes that came up here was that academia seems to be stuck in this tenure track, one size fits all mode of employment. And um, this is kind of pushing people into certain roles that they doesn't always match their, their skills. What can we do beyond uh, the institutions? Just uh, disciplinary organizations could adopt ethical platforms with respect to core problems uh, in burnout. Well, um, do we, should we really be graduating this many PhDs, creating this massively competitive environment, which uh, may be contributing to burnout? What are the ethics with that? Um, redefine and expand successful uh, de definitions of what successful work uh, means. For governments, um, it may mean focusing on accreditation outcomes rather than processes, uh, which relates to the point about bureaucracy. You want to track and minimize those requirements and allow institutional diversity and specialization so that people can feel more satisfied in their work. Again, coming back to this idea that it's not always about the amount of work that you're putting in. So thank you very much. Um, that's kind of an overview of um, what I discovered in kind of diving into this, um, this topic. And 
I will also, um, if you guys are interested, I can also send you the slides, which has a few of the references mm -hmm. for just a few, um, a few of the uh, sources that I've used, and a number of books that I've found people recommending to, to help faculty deal with burnout. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you so much, um, Mark. That is very, very useful. There are so many points that, that I really want to go deeper, <laughs> but it's going to take the whole session just talking about that with you. So, and yes, please share the slides, especially the recommendation references. That's definitely going to, I guess, going to be very helpful for a lot of people here. Um, again, like I said, there are so many specific points that I want to go deeper. Um, but instead of going to you, maybe um, I'm just going to go to Fadi. Maybe Fadi can just go in and somehow um, justify some of the points that you made. Um, so Fadi, if you do not mind being in your position, especially, you know, you, you have so many different stuff and faculty members um, reporting to you. And everybody knows that um, recently the computer science engineering department went through major revamping and you guys were very, very successful. And I guess one of the most successful um, department here at AUS, I guess um, this semester alone, you guys have more than 700 plus students, new students. So this is, this is very impressive. So how exactly do you do that in your position? You know that, you know, you have all the factors that Mark just mentioned about balancing research, balancing teaching, you know, taking care of your own um, agendas and also um, the faculty as well. So how exactly do you do that? Okay, so thanks, Norita, and uh, thanks, Mark, for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my talk actually um, probably is different. Uh, the points I prepared were based on the uh, discussion that I had earlier with Norita, where we're going to focus on three different things. Um, basically, how are we empowering the students during the pandemic to keep them excited, energized, you know, active? How are we empowering the faculty, uh, you know, also to, uh, you know, continue their uh, excellent work during the pandemic, despite, you know, the remote uh, work environment that we're in currently? And then what, um, you know, can be done today, um, you know, during or with or without the pandemic to push forward, you know, the department and uh, reach, you know, uh, the growth that they're looking for. Yes, um, you know, alhamdulillah, in the CEC department, we did cross this semester the 700 number undergraduate uh, limit. So with the graduate students, we're around 740 students. So, um, you know, and we're looking for, of course, continuous growth in the next uh, years to come. So let's start with the first one about students. I'll probably spend a few, you know, a few minutes on each. Mm -hmm. So starting with students, um, you know, switching to the pandemic uh, where we went from an on-site education to an online education, um, you know, many of us, as you know, went uh, through some, um, you know, um, uh, struggles, including the students. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that I face with students specifically is that how do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them excited? Most of the time, we as faculty and instructors have our cameras on on the other side. We don't see them. And um, how do you know if they're still there or not? OK, so, um, you know, even when you used to give a lecture in class, when you see a student, you know, playing with a phone or um, dazing or not really focusing or paying attention, a simple eye contact can make that student be more alert and more uh, appreciative of the, of the effort you're putting at the lecture that you're delivering. Um, so that is all gone, of course. There is no eye contact when the, when the camera is off. Okay. So the things that we in, in the CEC department have been looking at is mainly to increase that engagement um, by frequent um, you know, um, uh, usage of, uh, of techniques during the class or the lecture, such as maybe having them speak more often, randomly select students to uh, uh, you know, ask them questions about the class, ask about their feedback. Uh, breaking the ice by talking a little bit more about the, you know, the uh, socially about, you know, what have they been doing, what they've did in the past or the, yesterday and so on. Um, in order to get them more excited, uh, maybe running things like online polling techniques, we know of poll EV, or Mentimeter and many others that allow us to run nice, um, you know, polling, um, uh, online polling systems during the class to engage them and to get them more excited. Um, uh, we do emphasize more on now the importance of the lecture that uh, they're listening to and how it's going to be relevant to their future career or post-graduation or a future internship or a graduate study and so on. Um, you know, making them more believe in, in what, what is being, what they're getting and understanding that uh, despite the pandemic, still we strongly believe in them. They are, you know, uh, they will be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, soon graduates and will have an impact around us and make a difference in the world. 
what we notice also is with with this extra engagement with the students in, in order to keep them basically alert during the class the lectures became slower and um, you know what used to be covered over a, a, a 50 minutes uh, you know period now might need an hour or an hour and you know and 15 minutes because more of the, we see more of the engagement with the students during the class just to keep them you know alert and so on so that's when it comes to the students um, uh, of course um, i have to also address that there are um, you know soft skills unfortunately that we lost we lost with this online pandemic by students, you know, not putting, not working together in teams, not, you know, presenting in front of us easily in class and so on. But we try to recover this by using the online, of course, uh, resources. Uh, maybe in, in our case in computer science and engineering, it was easier for us to use, uh, you know, um, uh, vir virtual labs to, you know, address some of the things that they used to do physically in the labs, um, you know, so that did, you know, uh, help. But maybe in other cases, that was still, still a challenge. But we hope that things will, you know, will uh, will go back to on site soon, anyways, and, and recover. Uh, when it comes to the faculty, this is the second part here on how to engage them during the pandemic, keep them excited, keeping them uh, up to date, and so on. I probably should stay, start by first thanking, you know, the AUS and the, the administration, the IT department, for really starting a very intensive, strong training program. Um, you know, they did provide us with, you know, the powerful tools. Uh, they did provide us with a lot of training and workshops. So that's really good to know, guidelines, tutorials. Um, you know, the communication was very important and the training was very important. Um, 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 in addition to that, of course, uh, you know, something that can be done remotely doesn't necessarily have to be done in person the same way. So we did have to, you know, in, in, my, in my case, empower the faculty to have them see where they can make an impact and how they can make an impact to push forward their classes. So, um, uh, as an example, for example, um, um, we had to give them the right tools to, to empower them. At the, at the end, technology that through today is nothing but a tool. It's really the most important thing in the class really is the faculty and, of course, the students. So, the faculty needs to, or the instructor is the one who is basically he or she delivering the, the stuff and, uh, and, 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 and doing it in, in a right way. Um, in addition to empowering them, we also had to, you know, to, to bypass this stressful time that we're going through is, I think Mark mentioned this in his, in his slide, is to have a clear vision and a clear communication of what basically the university is going through, what, what we, is, is expected from the output. Having an open channel of communication with the faculty to continuously hear back from them in case they have any concerns, any problems. Um, you know, uh, with a continuous open, which I'm, I'm not necessarily, you know, um, a specific slot for our case in the CEC department, we have, you know, uh, we can call each other at any time, we can drop an email to each other at any time, weekends, weekdays, it doesn't matter. So, so that, that openness and that transparency really did help. Um, we should always continue, of course, uh, from, a, from a leadership point of view to recognize, encourage, uh, promote, um, whether it was the students or the faculty and the instructors, and maintain this healthy, um, you know, uh, uh, family-style environment so that they can basically, um, you know, excel, encourage their innovation, um, you know, push forward for teamwork, for collaboration, um, and also provide them with things that I think are very important in academia. And in our case, it's academic freedom. When you have academic freedom, also, that is something that is valuable that allows the faculty to really, uh, as well, uh, innovate and uh, and put on his best or her best to basically deliver. The, uh, the material uh, in, the, in the best way that they see reasonably. Um, providing professional development is something that's very important as well uh, when it comes to the uh, faculty. Maybe during the pandemic, it could be a different style of uh, professional development, things that are related more to online teaching or the online tools and resources. Um, the IT equipment that we currently have, um, you know, delivering, uh, you know, to the faculty, the needed tools, whether it was a software or hardware, to also help them in delivering their best material. I know for us in the engineering college, for example, um, you know, faculty were and instructors were provided with tablets. Uh, you know, we already have laptops. We are allowed to take it back home and so on. So things of that sort that can also uh, simplify the stress of the pandemic and the pressure of this online education and make it easier for us to engage on, in a, on a daily basis with our students. That's the second point. Now, when it comes to the third point, we're basically uh, we wanted to, um, you know, push forward the students. So this is more of the department, and this is, of course, a departmental effort in which me, myself, and the 22 colleagues that I have in the computer science engineering department, we really 
had to put together really a plan on how to push forward this department, how to um, um, attract more students into it, uh, how to uh, involve and so on. So we know that our customers here are the students. They are the, I mean, the main customers. They are the ones that we are we're tasked with delivering to them an excellent education that will enable them to be a problem solver or a, a, you know a, a make a difference in the real world after graduation. Um, and that was basically our mission: is how do we mean to provide this to the students? So I have actually you know I've listed here several top points that I can go through, which basically. Um, discuss some of the things that we've done in order to empower these students. And these, of course, are points that can be addressed during the pandemic uh, or post-pandemic, of course. Uh, first is we had to, um, you know, the communication is very important, just like we have a communication with the faculty and staff, we also have communication with the students. So we in the CEC department, for example, we launched a CEC portal, a student portal, which basically allows us to post things at an easier scale, having this open dialogue with the students. Uh, the brand, the loyalty is very important. We, we, we in the CEC, even we have like a CEC logo for ourselves in the department that empowers the students to make them feel part of this, um, uh, even after graduation as alumni, always recall and remember back and back to the, to the department. Um, have an excellent set of faculty and lab instructors that can, um, uh, in addition to, of course, to lab, library and resources that can deliver the best of the education uh, or to the students that could also empower them. Um, being able to listen to the students and, and have you know, frequent um, engagements with them to hear from them and see what their needs are and what they look for in terms of improvement and pushing forward. Uh, simplifying their day-to-day -day activities and lives, especially today as we go through this online education uh, you know, style of, 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 of delivery of, or style of delivery of lectures, um, um, you know, we had to switch to many things, had to switch to, ser to digital services. Um, you know, in the past, we've had students, um, you know, visit us if they want to add your name on a waiting list or visit us if they want to change majors and so on. Now everything is done in an online form. So digital transformation is very important. Luckily, you know, this AUS and us and CSE, we did many things ahead of time where advising was transformed to be done digitally as opposed to using a paper and pencil. You know, attendance using a mobile app where we have where attendance is taken uh, from a mobile app with the waiting list is done through the portal and so on. So many of the services that can make the life of this easier and better can be done now digitally, uh, which really you know, um, made, the, made it more enjoyable for them less than their experience with us at the US. Uh, the curriculum is very important. Having an up-to-date curriculum that is always uh, you know, uh, relevant is extremely important also to stay up-to-date with what market needs and, and uh, the, the interests of the students and so on. Uh, empowering them and the students with internships, professional developments, and invited speakers, you know, external visits. Unfortunately, the visits are on maybe hold today as we speak. However, we still uh, actively bring in speakers. I think it became much easier now to bring in speakers because you no longer have to fly them in or bring them over. Uh, now they can be anywhere in the world and give a, an hour lecture easily. Uh, connecting them to the alumni, sharing with them successful stories from the outside world, bringing in mentors that can be role models for them, um, uh, showing them, you know, a Hall of Fame. We have a Hall of Fame, the CSE, where we have now ministers who, you know, where in our student programs, we have uh, Her Excellency Sarah Al-Amiri, for example, who finished her bachelor's and master's with us. Now she's a minister and she's, you know, in charge of the, of the Mars space uh, mission and so on. So, you know, having these kind of uh, stories can always inspire them to, to promote them and get them, you know, more excited. Um, in terms of basic also innovation, uh, we uh, recently launched um, uh, the CEC annual awards, where basically in order to promote the students and, and, and empower them, uh, we're looking for their, you know, not necessarily only GPAs or what they can do, but maybe their leadership skills, their talents, their hobbies, things that basically also can show that they can, they have, you know, um, um, uh, different things that they can share with the community and so on. Um, um, engaging with, the, with them, with the students and with the community through newsletters, through competitions, through, you know, uh, announcements. That is something that we continue to do through the media exposure. That's something that's also interesting that we're focusing on. And finally, for those students who are definitely interested in going for graduate school, whether it was a master's or a PhD, you know, empowering them with research at their undergraduate also can be something that we are, um, you know, working on to help them in basically pushing forward their agenda later on. Uh, having a few publications of the undergraduate, you know, with some of the faculty can always, you know, uh, help them in landing on good opportunities or either admissions to a top university or even a scholarship or an assistantship to continue there. And that I'll stop at this point here.
Thank you so much, Fadidia. So, so, um, so many points and so refreshing. Um, I actually have a lot of follow-up questions that, that I want to ask you, but I'm looking at the time now um, just to be, <laughs> to be fair. So let's go to Jessica and hopefully if we have time, I will come back to both of you. Um, so Jessica, the, your, your, your role is a little bit different, I, I suppose, compared to um, Fadi in a way, um, especially that given the fact that AABP focused on, um, I guess, doing something for a very long time in a way that you're teaching the same subject, um, you're meeting the same students every day for very long hours and doing a lot of repetitive um, things. So in this very specific environment, how exactly do you motivate um, your peers to do their best? And you know, in, in your role as well, you, you are also teaching and in your role as, as the leader, I mean, what, what, mm -hmm. how, and what exactly do you do to, to motivate people? Yeah, th thanks for this question. And I think in, in many ways it ties into what Mark was talking about initially. And thank you both to, to Mark and Fadi for your, your excellent um, comments that you've made. Um, so when we're talking about the face-to-face the -face teaching, my colleagues will be seeing their students for 225 hours in a semester. Um, so that's the same group of students for uh, 225 hours. So burnout is always a very key factor in, in our role. You know, the, these um, constantly trying to energize the students, staying positive, encouraging them when they're failing, um, you know, trying to pick them out of their, their, their negative phases because already they want to be in their major, they want to be studying. So there's a lot of energy that's invested in that. And I think um, I like to look at it as a car, a manual car, which is stuck in the first gear. And, you know, that horrible grating sound, you know, that's what my colleagues face through that, throughout the semester. And I think uh, we feel that normally and that's, it's um, completely um, increased during this period because it, it, there's even more pressure with uh, being online, trying to break up the classes into small, more manageable, accessible chunks. Um, you were talking about um, Dr. Uh, Fadi, you were talking about the um, having the polls and the uh, making students speak together in groups and engaging them. I think that's always been a factor of what we have to do. Um, but I think when you talked about the internal factors, uh, Mark, you're talking that's something that comes across very well. We know what the cadence of our semester is, and I think it's it's we plan our curriculum, we plan our syllabi. And we, we give attention to that, but also I think particularly in this situation, we have to mentally plan for our own well-being uh, as the semester rises and falls because it does follow a pattern. Um, but we have to give as much attention to um, factoring in our own uh, well-being into that, um, those peaks and troughs so that we don't overload ourselves. Because I think one of the first points that you said, Mark, was about saying saying yes to things or to saying over committing and one of the things that we face as a department is we want to get our students as involved as possible in all of the different activities that are going on and so that means that there can be unexpected things that come up as much as we plan for the controllable um, items there will be things that arise during the semester so it's leaving a little bit of space for those uncontrollable things in our, pl in our mental planning for how we're going to take care of ourselves over the semester. And, and I think also for my colleagues, you know, they find that this teaching, uh, very high teaching load during the semester means that a lot of their reflection and um, professional development, reading, research, upskilling is usually done when the semester ends. So that, that follows a slightly different pattern. <laughs> yes. Um, looking at how to prioritize activities that benefit the faculty, the, the staff, the students and the department as a whole, um, the title of this session was Navigating, and I think that was very apt because that's how I've seen this process. You know, at the beginning when we all went online, um, the main goal, I think, was let's just make sure we make this shift and transition to online teaching effectively so that our students, um, that our students get the best experience, are able to finish the semester in a strong and positive way. So that became the focus. Um, obviously, we had the IT training and uh, very intensively and then that was ongoing through the semester and was greatly appreciated. But um, then a, a lot of my colleagues and myself included used the summer period to really try and upskill and look at ways that we can 
make our classes more engaging, knowing that we were going to be teaching online in the fall, that gave us a chance to plan and to really invest our time in trying to make the experience as enjoyable as possible. So when I was thinking about taking a step back from this, thinking about what, what is it really that, that makes the university experience? And I think if many of us reflect on that, we think, okay, the classes were impactful. What I learned was very important to me and still is important to me now. But the things that were very dear to me and um, were, were the things that were associated with, with the people, the community, the unexpected encounters that you made with people walking around the campus, the, the conversations that may have only been a, a journey up in an elevator, but were very meaningful and they're, they're things that you reflect on later on in your life. So over the summer, I was thinking, well, how, how can we regain that sense of community and how can we retain that in what we deliver to our students? Because that's always been a very important part for our, our students in the bridge program to have that kind of identity um, and support network that we're able to provide them. So it, it's having that sense of a belonging. Um, Dr. Freddie, you mentioned about having the, the, the uh, logo specifically for your department. Um, you know, I think having that identi identity with the group is really important. And so we've taken several steps to try and embrace that. I mean, first of all, I have to say, Narita, I think the CITL workshops and the FDC workshops uh, last semester were a huge part in bringing us all together as a, an AUS community, which has been really valuable. Um, and then from our um, professional side within our department, we, we were thinking about having some kind of social gatherings, but that I think we all had like Zoom or Google Meet fatigue at that point. But what worked really well for us were the uh, PD, informal PD workshops, um, whether it's a kind of fast and furious idea share or top tips from for, for 10 minutes, a quick exchange of ideas on a fairly regular basis. And that was led by uh, Lauriel Mehdi, who's here with us today. And she did a, a great job in, in leading these sessions, which I think have been, we'll be, bring along a cup of coffee and just have a quick idea share. And that's been really valuable to all of us because it's not only learning, but it's also being together uh, in a structured, but also a more social um, environment. And then um, we've got several uh, particular projects which are looking at how to integrate um, our, our in instructors together with our students. And one of the first ones was this AABP quiz night that we've uh, introduced and that's led by um, the AABP student club officers led by Jennifer Hassan. And, um, these quiz nights are replacing what we used to do on a, on a Wednesday night down at the football field where we used to gather and play volleyball or football or, or just sit there and chat and have a picnic with the students and uh, instructors together. And uh, these quiz nights have been have, have kind of morphed from what were cahoots and uh, lots of different competitions to um, we're moving now more towards getting to know your activities and uh, uh, maybe even a talent show. But it's what underlies all of that is that sense of bringing people together and sharing information that we would normally share in a classroom, uh, just as a uh, kind of off the cuff comment, but that's not happening anymore because our class time is usually dedicated to uh, achieving our learning outcomes for that particular day. So it's uh, finding those moments of insight into the humanity of what, what is our community. Um, we also have the BNN, which is uh, created by uh, uh, Jennifer Hassan as well, which is um, a play on the CNN, which is a way of our students being able to get together once a week on a Thursday from 12 until 12.20. Uh, we have an anchor we've got uh, who, who reports on international news, local news, and gives information about the celebration, celebrates the achievements of the students within the bridge program, whether they're in sporting achievements or in uh, passing their IELTS or TOEFL scores or particular academic achievements outside of um, those parameters. And uh, we've been inviting a guest speaker from different colleges to come and join us. Um, I see Nora's here, she was one of our guest speakers, which is really valued. And it's a, it's a way of um, showing our students what's out there and, and in the past in previous semesters our students have been going to lectures they went to one of Mark's lectures which was really valuable too and I think seeing what is out there because our students are all coming your way uh, hopefully sooner rather than later so it's really nice for them to be able to see what's coming to them 
Um, in terms of engaging our community to participate in sporting activities, trying to reinforce with the students that being away from your computer is as important as being in front of it at the right time, obviously, not during class. Um, but the Friends of Cancer Patients, um, they launched an app during the Relay for Life that they had last year. And that app was active over the summer with three different challenges. So they had an August challenge, they had an October challenge, and another one in December. And uh, we found that was a really nice way of getting everyone in our department to walk together because a lot of people are using the evening times to, to, to walk around campus or to walk outside with their families or, um, or their bubble that they're, 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 they're sharing their time with. And so that was really, really motivating. We ended up winning the last challenge, I think. We're still waiting for our certificates and prize, whatever that may be. But um, I think it was more to that sense of us all pulling together to try and achieve a common goal and we were doing that by having our, our steps tracked on the app so uh, that was that was a really wonderful way to get people engaged in something that was away from from our class time um, then in terms of trying to make this a meaningful exchange uh, experience during the semester we have been participating in the Salia global connect express program and the first time we did it was last semester and um, I think we we want a Raja and, and Jen won a, um, an implementers uh, award for their contributions to making this so success successful for the first time round. So congratulations to them. We're doing it again this semester, and hoping that this gives the students in our program the chance to uh, still learn and grow and build international networks, even though we have these constraints on our on our physical freedom. And yeah, we, we've um, also got the ABP Instagram, which is run by the students predominantly as a way of kind of uniting our community and celebrating all the different things that are going on. In addition, and that feeds towards the end of the semester with our awards ceremony, which tries to acknowledge, as, as Fadi said as well, all these different aspects and ways that the students contribute and grow in the learning environment during a semester. I could go on. There's so many more things, Narita. Do you want me to continue? <laughs> Shall I stop there? Uh, thank you so much, Jessica. That is so refreshing. Um, wow, so many great ideas that you guys are doing over there. Um, I, I, you know, I was just looking at all um, the different ideas that, that you just presented and also what Fadi also said earlier. So it seems to me that both of you are doing a lot more nowadays um, compared to before. So this, this is a lot uh, in a way. Um, so before I ask you guys more questions, I just want um, to see if anybody from the audience and any participant have any questions specific to any of our panelists, um, just please feel free, use your mic and you know, just ask, jump in and ask questions. Um, while waiting for people to ask questions, so I just want to follow up very quickly. Um, the fact that I guess we as human, we always, you know, always feel very obligated to say yes when somebody asks us to do something. Um, with that, um, I just want to say thank you to all three of you for saying yes when I invited you guys to be on this panel. So thank you. <laughs> so um, how exactly, I mean, especially for, for Fadi and you, Jessica, how exactly do you ask um, your colleague for favor or you know asking them to do something without making them feeling obligated to say yes because you are the boss so yeah one of you just yeah Fadi, maybe we start with you okay so um uh, you know for forcing somebody it will never work even if you force somebody to do something uh, you will not get what you're expecting to get and it will be done in a, with a with a uh, poorly done so it, you will not really gain much from it in my opinion, uh, I really like to see uh, the, uh, the person doing something that he or she enjoys, uh, having giving them something where they can make a difference or make an impact. So um, uh, the way I see this is any uh, leader or any director or any uh, head, uh, if they are asked to basically assign a task to, uh, to, uh, to uh, one of their uh, faculty or instructors, or even you know, staff members, it's his or her duty to know the strengths and weaknesses of the, of, the, of the members and their team, and basically then assign it to that member that he or she feels 
are the closest to it or the best. And it's always good to have a dialogue, have a talk, discussion, and so on. And is if it's something that nobody likes, and basically it's, uh, then there's always, you know, a, a nice, it, it, it's always have to have, a, good to have a conversation before, where basically you, under, you explain the need for this and the importance for it, and, uh, you know, and provide them with, for example, tell them this will probably be rotational, you can do it start it now, and then we'll get some support or help and rotate it others. But my opinion is, um, you always give it to somebody who really likes to do it. So uh, I hate to see, say, to use the word that we will force it onto somebody. Uh, you will never, you know, gain much by doing this. Thank, thank you, Fadi. Um, Jessica, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think that I've, um, you know, there will be c cases where things that we, we don't necessarily want to ask people to do arise, you know, with scheduling or, uh, or different types of responsibilities that come up. And um, I hope that people can thrive and enjoying their tasks that they're doing and grow in doing them as well. Um, I think that that links into what you mentioned about with showing empathy, um, trying to uh, show the benefits that can come out of certain tasks that people are assigned to. Uh, I, I would just uh, echo really what uh, Fadi said in his response. All right, thank you. Um, this is another question that I have since I, I did not see any question on the chat. Um, again, on my, my personal thing, um, how do you keep in touch with your colleague, especially during this time, we don't really see each other very often. So um, touching back to the point that Mark said earlier, you know, um, saying hello or just, you know, asking your friends um, how they're doing, that's definitely, you know, all the small thing add up to, 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 the, to the person's happiness or the mood itself. So how um, do you guys, I mean, the three of you, especially um, both of you, Fadi and, and Jessica, how do you keep in touch with your colleague? I mean, just to show that you care and you appreciate, you know, everything that, you did, that they have done, that, that they contribute to the department itself. This is my last question, by the way, <laughs> looking at the time. Uh, well, I, I think um, from, from, from my perspective, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of trying to keep boundaries. And so I've been using, thinking, being much more mindful myself about my communication. I have a tendency to over communicate, um, but that's because I genuinely believe in, in sharing uh, decisions and information. However, that, that can be quite stressful for people. So I've tried to, um, when I'm emailing, communicating with people, I will do scheduled send. So I'll make sure that things go out at a time, which is not in the middle of the night, even though I email them, you know, I'm sending the emails at that time. So trying to be mindful of their um, kind of working hours, not adding t stress to them just before they're going into class. Um, I also uh, try and make sure that if I'm communicating about something personal, I'll do it by WhatsApp or a text message. If it's, it's work related, I'll use email, trying to keep those boundaries between the work and, uh, and professional, uh, work and personal life there. And, and also trying to minimize my communication so it's as simple as possible and as, uh, so I don't send multiple emails all the time. And that's been a really major, um, I've been really trying to do that from my side to make sure that it's as, as um, it reduces stress as much as possible. Yeah, great. Um, do you want to add anything, Paddy? Okay, just to echo what Jessica said, which is uh, really great. So we do something similar. Uh, transparency and communication is extremely important at all times. And uh, if during pandemics and where everybody is at a different place, that's even more important, in my opinion. So definitely these emails, frequent emails of, you know, the status, the updates, uh, even a simple good, uh, you know, a piece of good news. This alumni just was awarded as a PhD. This person just won an award. This person just got a paper accepted. Something, you know, uh, uh, the simple good morning touch, you know, can really raise the spirit and excite others and push them to do well and hopefully be the next in that email. Uh, but to be, to be fair, in, for us in CSE, we really look at ourselves as a CEC family. I'm proud to say that we are a family of 23 members. And we have a WhatsApp group where we have some very exciting members who keep calling us with jokes and things to break the ice at all times. So we have, a, uh, you know, the WhatsApp group, which we use sometimes for, uh, you know, for, uh, of course, for uh, professional work and sometimes, and, but mostly for, of course, for social uh, related matters and to breaking the ice. 
But I see, by the way, I mean, just to follow up on Jessica's point, we are actually considering now to switch one way of our communicating with the students to WhatsApp, and we're collecting their phone numbers to engage the students more and have, you know, mass broadcasted with like a business account to students. We see companies already doing it now, chat boxes using WhatsApp and so on. So I think us in academia, as part of our digital transformation, it's extremely to keep, important to keep track. And students, I think, don't read an email as much as they read a WhatsApp and don't interact. And with WhatsApp, you're you're forced to make it short. You cannot send them a 10-page email over a WhatsApp uh, memo. So in WhatsApp, it's brief, short. We know their, their attention span is very limited now. Uh, you know, the generation is different than our generation. So we need to keep things very brief. And a WhatsApp message can really do the job uh, very easy. So, so we are actually considering to move some of our business-related, uh, you know, communication through WhatsApp as well, in addition to our emails. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, now I see that Yahya has a question or maybe a comment. Yahya. Yeah, I just have follow up uh, to your last question. First of all, I would like to thank the three of you for this nice uh, presentations. Uh, I have a question maybe directed more to, to Fadi and to Jessica since you are leading departments and you have people report to you. Uh, you know, many of the faculty and the staff uh, might go into psychological, mental uh, uh, problems or sometimes a breakdown. Okay, some of them would be panicking. What are the measures that you implement? Uh, to check basically on on those conditions, basically, I mean, my, some many people are you maybe closed. They will not come and and you know open up. They will not come and talk, and they will show. But that would be reflected maybe uh, internally, maybe on their performance or on their life or on their attitude or many other factors. So, do you have the measures that you implement to check basically if everything's okay? Okay. Um, Jessica, I'd like to start. Would like to start? Oh, I, I think my answer is um, sim simply no. I think, but it, it should be the answer should be yes, really, in in terms of the fact that we we check so many other things, uh, measure and track so many other aspects of our work. But that's one thing that that we don't track. I think mentally, I do. You know, um, I try and make sure, just like in my class, I would try and make sure I used every student's name during the the class if it's a small class. I, I try and make sure when I'm at work that I would check in with every person at least once during a day, um, just to say hi or you know how are you doing. But I, I think that when it's um, when we're online, it, it's difficult and the things can fall through the uh, through the cracks. And and um, it's a really good question. Yeah, following up on Jessica's point, yeah, yeah, an excellent point. Uh, thank you for uh, asking it. Um, as Jessica mentioned, when we're in the office, we can just we'll have a walk in the morning, uh, you know, a coffee break and so on, and chit chat with the team to see who's in and uh, who's okay and who's not and so on. Uh, now that we, each of us is at home, uh, it's more challenging and more difficult. But again, a simple WhatsApp message, I mean, frankly, I, we don't do a daily check. I don't think we even do a weekly check, but we see the communication every now and then. And the, camp, the nice thing about having the, the, the nice closed campus is that you know, uh, all of us know each other and, you know, if there is a problem, probably we can hopefully, you know, get to know about it and help uh, resolve it before it's, uh, it escalates. But, um, but probably uh, you mentioned something that should be addressed uh, by, you know, the university and where we have a better communication and a better, um, you know, communication channel while we are at home. Good point to raise it. Thank you. Actually, if I sorry, if I could you just jog my memory, if I could just um, add to what Fadi said, um, I, I was doing some initial. Um, th there have been some studies in UK, uh, St John Moore's U University in uh, UK, about um, mood gauges, looking at how to measure people's mood, and they were using it actually with students, tracking students' mood through the semester, just as a kind of thumbs up response. But in a way, that's the kind of system that, if we want to start tracking our own, <laughs> our own health within our within our departments, that could be a way to do that. That's some kind of mood gauge. But I think the danger at the moment is that everyone's so fed up with getting surveys and uh, questionnaires. I don't know how that would be. It's a little bit impersonal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the time right now, so I'm. I'm I, I know that a lot of people. Um, have other stuff to do because it's only five o'clock now. So before we leave again, I just want to say thank you 
Um, Mark, do you have any final um, thought that you want to add to the discussion? No, um, thank you very much. Um, there, there are a lot of great ideas there. Oh. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is this is definitely a conversation that we do not want to stop. We just want to, to, to continue. So next week, we will have three more faculty members just going to talk about, you know, what we go through on the day to day basis. So please join us again next week at the same time, same day. So again, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, um, the panelists for being here. I mean, I learned a great deal today. Thank you. So see all of you again, hopefully next week. Thank you. Thank you.